All right. So we have a great big thing coming up in a couple days. Anybody know what that is? Election. Boom. People are paying attention. Yes. Elections. Election date is Tuesday. Get out and vote. All right. And so uh, how many people receive the brochures in the mail that tells you who's running for what, this and that? And how many, of them, how many of them are so short that they don't have all the candidates for your area? They don't have what they stand for or anything. You have no clue who these people are. And you have no clue who didn't make it on that brochure. Well, there is a resource called Huey Report. Just go and Google it, Huey Report, and it will give you everybody who's running. It doesn't matter what category. I'm not telling you who to vote for, but it'll tell you who's running and what they stand for, whether they stand on biblical principles, whether they stand on patriotic principles, whether they don't stand anywhere at all. They just, you know, whatever. It'll tell you all of that. Go find out before you put a mark next to somebody's name what they stand for, okay? That's, it's discernment on your part. You should, you should do that, okay? That's how we change a nation. All right. Great. Awesome. Now, Pastor Brett. <laughs> you know what I got microphones you know I'm not a techie you guys got me strapped down like I'm doing neurofeedback here okay um, good morning ha Good morning. One more bit of the news. Hey, thank you, Daniel. Awesome job today. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, uh, Anthony. Thank you, John and Stacy. Thank you for serving. I know we've said it, but we can't say it enough. God bless you. This is a good day. Uh, okay, good morning. Welcome to Rise Up Church, where we believe in God and His Son, Jesus Christ, and we believe in miracles performed by His hand, where we acknowledge also that there is a correlation between our thoughts and and the tangible presence of God in our lives. That's why we're in a series called Miracle Mindsets. This is part four. We know that there are some people who seem to walk in the presence of God in a different way. They seem to know him on a different level, and as such, they have testimonies and experiences that are literally out of this world. Last week, I feel like we went to the movies, and we saw an epic showdown on Mar Mount Carmel. It's uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, if you weren't here, if you have your Bible, you can go there again, because we're going to, this week, um, it was a showdown between wannabe gods and the genuine article. But Sunday, I was, I was having lunch with some good friends, and I was thinking, you know, I never really even got to the, to the story's climax. I never really got to the, to the end part, the part that we're going to talk about today. So today, we're continuing the movie uh, with a flashback, kind of a little prequel, and then the sequel. It's one of the most important people in all of Scripture. His name is Elijah. He was a mighty man. A mighty man, even among the prophets, he was a mighty prophet, maybe even the mightiest of all the prophets that God used. But I want to get this into your heads, if it's not already. The first two Scriptures, it's really one Scripture from two different translations. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Can we read that together? One, two, three, read. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Let's read the next one. Ready, read. Elijah was a he as human as we are. That is really important because when you read about these adventures, this crazy, like, God and fire and prophets and miracles, God's saying, I want you to know, and I'm going to even remind you in James in the New Testament, in chapter 5, verse 17, that he was like you. Someone say like me. We got to get that because... Um, it will help you. Let me just say that. So he was a man like us, a nature like us. And to understand Elijah as a person, you kind of got to talk a little bit about the times. You under, have to understand the times in which he lived. During the half century that followed the reign of King Solomon, there were seven kings that served on the throne of, of northern Israel. Um, seven in 50 years. And these were bad kings. They were extremely wicked kings, and they led the people into a complete and utter free fall of sin and rebellion against God until you could barely even recognize that this was God's people. You could barely even tell that this was Israel, part of God's people, part of God's plan, and part of God's promise. They didn't look like it. And the worst of all these kings is King Ahab, the most wicked bar none. 
He's in power when Elijah comes onto the scene. And probably the dumbest, most wicked thing that King Ahab did was marrying a wicked witch woman named Jezebel, wherein he violated every principle that God had given him. And Ahab didn't have the backbone to oppose his wife, so he simply followed her, and together they committed devastating acts of evil. I have a little passage from the message paraphrase. I'll just read it to you. It's not in your notes, but it says, Ahab did even more open evil before God than anyone yet. A new champion in evil. He went all out, first marrying Jezebel, and then by serving and worshiping the god Baal. He built a temple for Baal in Samaria and then furnished it with an altar for Baal. Worse, he went on and built a shrine to the sacred whore Asherah. He made the God of Israel angrier than all the previous kings of Israel put together. So in the midst of this darkness comes a rather strange guy, an eccentric person. Someone described him as, in Scripture as a hairy man wearing a leather belt around his waist. He walks into the presence of this evil king and pronounces judgment on him. It's a little review from last week for those that weren't here or even those that were. He says, he goes to the king, he says, as surely as the Lord God of Israel lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. That's what he tells him. He says, king, it's going to be dry. It's not going to be any rain, no dew, no moisture for until I say, get yourself together. And so over the next three and a half years, things go from bad to worse. There's a drought in the land, just as he had proclaimed. The king and his wife are killing the prophets of Yahweh. That's the prophets of God, the true prophets. Some of them are hiding in caves. There is a drought, and a drought doesn't just come by itself. A drought is a root cause of other things. When you have a drought, you automatically have a famine, because if there's no crops, there's no food, there's famine in the land, there's no food, there's no commerce, there's poverty in the land, there's not as much nutrition, there's... there's there's sickness in the land, and there's, you know, hopelessness sets in when things are bad on all sides. And the people are in bad shape, and then, on top of all that, worse than all that, is they're worshiping false gods. That's what Elijah walks into. And I think it's brilliant. The way that Elijah gets us, if you read the story and you listen to what's happening, he gets us to believe in the promise of revival. We talk about revival, we hear about revival, we're not always sure exactly what is revival, but I sure hope it comes, because everybody who's spiritual says, bring revival, God. It's when the hearts of the people turn back to the one true God, and Elijah calls for a showdown on the mountaintop, and the king comes, the prophets come, the people come, and God shows up, and God shows off. And the deal was, if you remember, wherever God would burn the sacrifice first without the help of men or any kind of butane, big lighter, or any of that stuff, that was going to be acknowledged as the one true God. And so Elijah gives these other prophets, these false prophets, every advantage. He goes, okay, what's going to be a sacrifice? You pick the first bull. You pick the one you want. You go ahead. You guys do that. And uh, gives them every advantage. And the prophets of Baal are pitiful. I mean, they're pitiful. They're walking around, dancing around, jumping around. They're bleeding. They're cutting themselves. They're screaming. They try everything all day. And Eliza's just waiting patiently. Hey, try again. Maybe he's in the restroom. Maybe he's on a road trip. And they can't get anything to happen. Then Eliza gets a turn. He says a quick prayer. And like lightning flash, God shoots fire down from heaven, consumes the bulls, consumes the rocks, the wood, and all the water. Everything gone. Whew good and at the end of this dramatic showdown we see the hearts of a nation turn back to god and here it is you ready for it one verse say yes okay first kings 18 39 and when all the people saw it they fell face down on the ground and cried out the lord he is god like we were singing today the lord he is god yes he is god it is undeniable there's no question about it the lord he is god they fell down on the ground So, the first point for today, because this is constructive, we're here to be edified, right? We're the saints. God says to come together so we can edify one another through the Word of God. And the first thing that I want to point out to you today is that miracle mindsets give glory to God. Or they give God glory. There you go. Same thing. They give God glory. And glorifying God means you acknowledge His greatness. It means you give Him honor. You give Him praise. You give Him worship. 
It's too good to not believe. You tell people because he and he alone deserves to be praised, honored, and worshiped. It means thanking him as a lifestyle. Thanking him means telling people he did it. Everybody say he did it. Point. He did it. He did it. He did it. I, I remember one time a, some guy was on the phone at a, at a, at a um, convenience store, and I overheard him talking about his financial woes. I had a couple bucks in my pocket, and I'm, I'm, you know, God told me, give him some money. And he's on the phone. He looks at the money. He looks at me. He looks at the money. He looks at me. And I just go like that. He did it. And it's kind of just stuck with me. And he's on the phone. She goes, uh, he did it. <laughs> no, no, like the guy. I mean, God, I mean, like he's trying to explain to this person on the phone that anyway. It wasn't a lot of money, but the point is he did it. He did it. He's the only reason I had anything to give. The only reason that guy got his comments, and it's the only reason you have anything in your life, and not to think so, is naive at best. So we give God glory, and, you know, in the, uh, one of the concepts of glory is weight. It's like almost like matter. It's like the glory of God, like when the glory fell or the glory departed. It's something you can feel. It's the presence of God, the tangible manifest presence of God. His glory has a weight to it. And so um, when, when, you know, you think about God, and you go, well, how do I give him glory? Because he is glory. He's glory. Fly. <laughs> um, how do we give him something that he already is in the first place? I think there's a key here in the next verse. What's the verse? You guys have it? It says, O nations. What's that verse? Oh, 1 Chronicles 16, 28. Thank you. O nations of the world, recognize. That's part of it. It means ascribe to God the credit that he deserves. Recognize the Lord. Recognize that he's glorious and strong. Recognize and give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Bring your offering. Give him gifts, in other words, and come into his presence. Worship the Lord in all his holy splendor. Give him glory. And God confirms that he feels this way in Isaiah 42, 8. He says, I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to anyone else, nor share my praise with carved idols. That's why pride is so terrible. It's bad. You're not supposed to lay one finger on God's glory. When God does something for you, God does something for you. I know we have a part to play, and we talk about that too, because we're not just supposed to let life happen to us. We have to do things in life, but the glory belongs to God. The glory, the, the, what's in my pocket, whatever ability I might have, whatever relationships he's played with, every good thing comes from the Father above. He says there's no shadow of turning up there. There's so much light, there's not even shadows because there's no darkness and everything in our life goes to him and we give him glory by recognizing and letting people know. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Now up to this point, Ahab and Jezebel have been hunting down and killing the true prophets. But when all this happens, Elijah has the people bring all the 450 false prophets down into the Kishon Valley, and he whacks every last one of them. That's my Italian upbringing. I'm sorry. He, he whacks, he, he executes all 450 of them. And we're not comfortable talking about this because we prefer the thought of our God being cuddly and, and tolerant and all L-O-V-E and all that. But in those days... The penalty for being a false prophet to Israel was death. That's the penalty. It says in Deuteronomy 18.20 that any prophet who falsely claims to speak in my name or who speaks in the name of another God must die. Muerto. Gone. And it even says if you look at it, like even the ones that represented God who spoke out of turn and spoke something that he didn't tell them that didn't come to pass, proved to be false. They had to be right all the time. Man, following God is a bloody business. <laughs> so, point number two, though, let's move on to that one. Look forward, uh, miracle mindsets, look forward to what God will do next. Mm, I love this one. If you notice in verse 40, prophets die. Look at verse 41, very next verse. Prophets die. Then Elijah said to Ahab, go get something to eat and drink, king, because I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. He had just done one of the greatest, most spectacular miracles of all time. Would you agree with that? I mean, that's pretty wild, like in front of everybody on the mountaintop, one against many. And then 
He puts to death what must have been an utterly exhausting task, 450 prophets. And Elijah doesn't even attempt to linger in any of it. He doesn't sit there on the mountaintop where the altar used to be. He doesn't do that. He doesn't sit there, and at least we're not told that he's in the valley of blood at this point, you know, lauding or, or, you know, congratulating himself for the giant victory. Immediately, he's looking forward to what comes next. He, he says, look, I got a rearview mirror. It's about this big. And by the way, so do all of us, right? It's about this big, this rearview mirror. But I got this windshield in front of me that's gigantic so that I can look forward to what God's going to do next in my life. And I refuse to live back there because God needs me up ahead because I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. <laughs> ah. It's faith. And, and Paul you know, God talks about hope, right? He's, God's all about the future. I know the plans I have for you. He doesn't say, I know the memories I have of you. He said, I know the plans I have for you, good and not evil, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. We don't deal in dope, we deal in hope. God says, if you don't even have hope, you're going to have a sick heart. Your heart's going to be sick. Have you ever been heart sick? I think all of us have been heart sick. It's a terrible feeling. It's like there's nothing to look forward to. There's nothing. Like, I have no hope in my life. But God always has hope. And I, I read something years ago, and this morning I just thought I'd throw it in just to, to tell you about it. But when the first astronauts went to the moon the, on the Apollo space mission, they had problems afterwards. They had psychological problems. They Some had deep depression. I guess because, like, where do you go when you've been to the moon? I mean, I've been training your whole life. Something no one's ever done. Yes, for mankind. And, right? The big leap and small step and all that. But, like, where do you go? Fortunately, with God, there's always somewhere to go. Fortunately, in Scripture, you never get to the end. You can read through it as much as you want, but He's always got more for you, no matter what. And it's important that you keep your eyes ahead and don't get stuck in the back. I mean, we talk about glory days, which I don't really know if they were ever really that glorious for most people. But we talk about them like they were. Or maybe they were the bad days. Maybe uh, things were so bad and we'll like stretch that out for a long time because people give us a little TLC when we, you did? Oh, my, how did you? Oh, and you know, yeah, it was so bad. I mean, I've heard, they got it, like journals full of how bad it was. But we should have journals about how good he was in the process. He's got more for us, and we're not to get caught up in the past. And so um, what he says to Ahab, what Elijah says to Ahab is, go up and eat and drink, for there is a sound of heavy rain. So Ahab went up and did what he said. Now, notice this is the king who just a little bit of go a little while back was hunting down prophets he would have liked nothing more to kill elijah when he first saw him he says oh you you troublemaker of israel brought this country to ruin you he would love to have killed him but look what's happening right now who's calling the shots the prophet he's telling the king what to do and the king's obeying that is why the church must keep its place in the face of all this political turmoil and all this turn to, you know, socialism, all the stuff that's going on in our country because it is far better to be anointed than to be elected. I mean, I'd rather be the prophet than the president any day. So he's calling the shots now, and the king is obeying, and he climbs to the summit of Mount Carmel now, and he bends down on the ground, and he puts his face between his knees, and I'm not going to demonstrate because I tried it, and it was, I couldn't get close. Um, <laughs> but his face, I know it's funny to even think of, but it's not that funny. Um, <laughs> he says to his servant, go and look toward the sea. So the servant went and looked toward the sea, and he said, uh-uh, pretty much. He said, there's nothing there. Seven times, Elijah said, go back. Go back. Go back. On the seventh time, the servant reported, okay, boss, there's a cloud. It's about as small as a man's hand. Not as big as a man's hand. It's like this big. And it's coming up out of the sea. And Elijah replied, go now and tell Ahab, the king, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew dark with clouds and wind and the heavy rain began to fall. And as I was, you know, kind of working through these, these passages, I'm thinking, why was, 
Why was Elijah able to say one short prayer? Bam! Fire shoots out from heaven to the exact spot and wins the war, basically. But now he has to pray seven times. And I, I, I feel like I figured it out. This is it. This is it. This is the grand finale. It wasn't the pow, pow, not the fire from heaven, not the defeat of the false gods. That was God's part. And God's part is easy for God, by the way. But this right here, this is the true battle. This is what saved the people. Elijah had said, how long are you going to waver between two gods? How long are you going to limp along? You know, if Baal's God, follow him. If the Lord's God, follow him. Worship him alone. And yes, fire fell. And yes, it was spectacular. And yes, false gods were put to shame. But it wasn't until, you got to get this, it wasn't until the people acknowledged the living God that the miracle came that would save them all. No rain, drought, famine, sickness, poverty. The people were in a terrible season. Fire from heaven wasn't going to change their life. They needed rain. Faith and the acknowledgement of God preceded the very thing they needed the most. When they got their minds right, they got their miracle. When they spoke about their belief in who God was, the miracle came and the people were saved and revival broke out in the land. Man, God, if you did it once, I know you can do it again. Bring it, Lord. So before the finale and before the revival could happen, before the rain came, some other things had to take place. Elijah goes up on the mountain, the same mountain. He was up there. He came back down. Now he goes back up and he puts his head between his knees. And this position says, he's in this position And he's like, I heard the sound of an abundance of rain. Not a sprinkle, not a trickle. I heard the sound. Now no rain has fallen in three and a half years, give or take. Not even dew. Not even like nothing in the morning. Things are dry. They're parched. They're barren. So it's dry on the outside, but he hears something on the inside. It's dusty out there but I hear rain in here. Anybody ever had that? I mean, who can I talk to here this morning that hears something on the inside that totally contradicts what's happening on the outside? Anybody? Oh, man, God wants to talk to somebody who's got a dream that seems ridiculous. That's you. If that's you, God's talking to you. A plan that seems preposterous. Someone with the uncanny ability to hear something on the inside that flies completely in the face of what's going on in the external. Who has a vision that's not visible? Where it's quiet and it's dry and it's gritty and dying and you hear a sound of thunder. Outside it's hot. And it's sunny with no chance of precipitation. But in your spirit, in your spirit, you hear an abundance of rain. And you know the sound because you've heard it before. Quiet on the outside. So Elijah climbs back up on the mountain. But why does he have to put his head between his knees? And this is uh, miracle mindset number three. Because miracle mindsets purposely block out distractions. I can't think of too many other reasons to do that. But we need to do that. We need to block out distractions. We need to do it even when it makes us look silly. The Bible says that he had taken a posture in that day of a woman giving birth and in that culture. It symbolizes something. It symbolizes labor. It symbolizes travailing in the spirit laborious prayer head between his knees and i don't want to get graphic but he worked at it it's like he was pushing for a long time a long time long enough for his servant to make seven trips out to look at the sea why why did he have to ask seven times one theory in biblical numerology is a number of seven in the bible represents completion Could it be that God is teaching us not to give up until the task is accomplished? Thank you, Pepper. You got one amen. 
I'm going to say it again. Could it be that God is teaching us not to give up until the task is accomplished? Hey, man, many people give up way too early and way too easy. And I'm reading a book right now, and it's by the um, founder of Hobby Lobby. His name's David Green. What a testimony. Uh, this book, okay, this company, in his, in his lifetime, they, they started this company. In the first five months, they did $136 in sales from August to December. This year, they're projected to hit $8 billion in revenue. And this guy is writing a book, and it's called Business by the book. He actually puts the word not. He says it's business not by the book, not by the traditional book that everybody talks about. He says, I can't tell you how many consultants came in over the years and looked at our business model and how we did everything and said this should not work. He said, I'm not doing it by that book. He said, I'm doing it by another book. I got to read this to you. He says, in March 2020, COVID hit. We closed 19 stores and wondered how will we take care of our employees? So they paid the employees that had been you know, laid off at those stores. And um, he said, how will we survive as a business? As things worsened day by day, he says, he took the on- uh, we took the only route we knew, prayer. I'm quoting. Stuck at home, Barbara and I came together for prayer every morning, noon, and eve. Got nowhere to go. We're here, honey. Things are a mess. They're very unpredictable. So morning, noon, and eve, we knelt in our living room and asked God, what should we do? By the end of April, we had to shut down every Hobby Lobby store in America. As we watched revenue drop to zero, it became apparent that we could not keep paying all our employees. We had to furlough the majority of our staff as we watched the nation shut down and wondered what would happen next. We kept flexing according to ever-changing government mandates, but we opened where we could, and somehow we watched sales increase. By July, sales had jumped back to the same level as the year before, and we breathed a sigh of relief. But then, something truly strange happened. Sales skyrocketed. August, September, October, November, each month surpassed our sales from the year before. Since our supply chain remained as backed up as ever, I wondered, what are our stores, what do they even have to sell? We had a hard time keeping ourselves stocked during the pandemic. Anything we had expected from overseas remained on hold. The stock on our warehouse shelves grew even sparser. How could we ship items we didn't have to stores we barely kept open? And yet merchandise kept flying off the shelves. It made no sense. At Christmas, we only had 60% of our normal inventory. And yet, sales kept rising. What are our customers buying, we wondered. When inventory goes down, sales should go down too. But they didn't. Our sales grew higher than ever. Incredibly, 2020 turned into the highest grossing sales year Hobby Lobby had ever known. Now, backing up, me and my wife got on our knees in our living room, is what he said, morning, noon, and night, and asked God what to do. He says, highest grossing year we ever had. We ended the year with 50% greater growth than the year before. But how? Such growth is unheard of. I'm still quoting. It's unheard of in normal years much less in years where stores were shut down and merchandise remained on ships. At the end of the year, we compared ourselves to other craft stores that sold the same items we did. He figured our competitors should have, they should have seen the same growth. They all sell the same stuff, but they did not. Only Hobby Lobby saw overall sales growth depend, despite the shutdown. How does that make sense, he asks. How could we sell the same items and yet be the only craft store to see significant sales growth? He said something else clearly was going on. In early 2021, I gathered my staff and reported the remarkable sales we had experienced the year before, and we celebrated. But I also explained that although we sold the same merchandise as our competitors, we alone had seen a growth in sales. How could that happen? He asks again. I believe it happened because God answered our prayers by his grace. We deserve no credit for this. Our smarts did not earn it. God alone deserved all the glory for this remarkable blessing. That's awesome, isn't it? I mean, this guy is, he's a minister, 100%. He is, um, his whole thing is a mission. And God took him from 100 bucks in his own lifetime to $8 billion and growing. Now, Elijah, he's got his head between his knees. 
his servant is running back and forth. He's looking toward the ocean. Here he comes again. Nothing. Go back. I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. There's nothing there. He comes again. Go back. I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. Go back. A mighty storm is coming. All right, now this can be difficult. You have to be careful because the people closest to you in your life, even good people, will not necessarily be on the same page as you. They'll bring you all kinds of information, but they don't have your revelation. They know what they see, but they don't know what you heard. I know that's why God told Habakkuk, write the vision. He said, write the vision. He said, make it plain on tablets so that a herald, a messenger can run with it. Because I'm not giving this to anybody else. I'm giving it to you. But here he is giving it to Elijah. And Elijah's the only one. And he's down there and he's telling the servant, go back. Go back. Go back. And on the seventh time, this is persistence. On the seventh time, he asked him, what do you see? Well, <laughs> um, it's not much. I, I wasn't Sure, I should even mention it, but for all this running back and forth and for all this praying you're doing, boss, it doesn't look like much, but there's a little cloud about this big, you know, way out there. I do see a puff about the size of a man's hand coming out of the ocean. The Bible's always relevant, always relevant to our life today. Is there anybody in here today whose sign of what's to come doesn't look like what you hoped for? You know, the evidence is so small for all the effort you put into it. The cloud is so tiny for all the time you've invested. You know, I practiced all summer. I still didn't make the team. No sugar, no carbs, 10,000 steps, blood sugar still high, and I've only lost seven pounds. After all the work you put into it, the business still can't afford any employees. The family seems like it's in shambles when you've been fasting and you've been praying for so long. God, my marriage. The ministry's so small after all you've invested, and you're about to get discouraged, saying, you know, Lord, I stayed up all night. I stayed up all night. I I put in overtime. I even did this person's part. I even did that person's part. I did more than my share, Lord. I even, I even, Lord, I've given it all I have, and all I see is a tiny, little cloud the size of a man's hand and god that that's even way out there in the distance but the bible says despise ye not the day of small beginnings this is a message of hope this is a message of persistence the bible says that your response to small answers can be defining moments in your life they literally can your response to small answers can be pivotal. How we look at what doesn't look like much can determine your destiny. If we're faithful in little things. So what did you do with the vision I gave you? Did you trust me when it didn't look like much? Did you believe it when you couldn't see it? One little bitty cloud the size of a man's hand would have been enough to make a lot of people come right down off the mountain and go, well, I tried. It didn't work. It's obviously not going to happen. But look at Elijah. Oh, man, I'm in trouble again. Stick with me. Look at Elijah. The tiny puff of cumulus, little cotton puff out there in the distance was all he needed. Again, Forgetting that which lay behind him and looking forward to what's ahead, Elijah gets up and again starts to issue instructions to the king. 
Elijah replied, go and tell Ahab. I mean, I see a cloud, boss. It's this little thing. It's like, go, now go. Go tell the king, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. King, you got to go. It's going to flood. You're going to go or you're going to be stopped. Meanwhile, the sky grew dark with clouds and wind and a heavy rain began to fall. Man. Just listen to the rain. In fact, give God some praise like it's raining. I'll fix this microphone. Go ahead. A heavy rain begins to fall. Because I know, and you know, that there are times in your life where God wants you to push. And I didn't put this in your notes because I've used it before, but push is an acronym. It means pray until something happens. Let's say it together. Pray until something happens. God wants you to push. So number four is miracle mindsets persist in prayer. They keep going. They keep praying. They keep going. They keep praying. They keep saying. They keep believing. They keep putting their head between their knees, laying down on the, on the floor, going to the closet, getting with the uh, people who will agree with you in the spirit. They keep on praying and Elijah was a man who prayed his whole life and he had power in his life because of prayer. He went to the Lord. He went to the Lord at one point and said, God, please don't let it rain for three years. The people have made a mess. Don't let it rain for three years, Lord. We're praying to get through next week. God, Elijah's praying for the weather to change for a long time. And yet... He did pray. Elijah could stand before the king. And the reason he could stand before the king and even issue instructions to that king is because he stood before the real king, the king of kings, every day of his life. And in chapter 17, verse 1, there's a simple, he says, in the God before before whom I stand. It's just, it's right there preceding all this stuff. And you can read about his life, and I encourage you to do that. Pray, though. He's saying pray. Pray earnestly. Pray constantly. Pray constantly. Thessalonians tells us pray without ceasing. Pray always. Do you know God never gets tired of your voice? He might, I don't know, maybe he gets tired of it if we complain a lot. But earnest prayer is not at all. Every instant is the best time to pray. There never comes a time to stop praying. And I'm not just talking about saying a prayer. I'm talking about living a prayer. Living your life in such a way that you're in the presence of God. You're carrying on a constant conversation with him. And so you think about that. Pray without ceasing. Everybody say pray without ceasing. Okay, you take that verse, and there's another verse in Hebrews that says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. You've heard that one, right? Never will I leave you. So you're here? Yeah, I'm here. You're right next to me? Yeah, I'm right next to me. So wait a minute. Pray without ceasing, and I'll never leave you or forsake you. So there's a person who's right next to you, figuratively, really in you, but all day long. Can you imagine spending a whole day with someone right next to you and you don't talk to them? That's just rude. (laughs) Awkward. But you have access. We're talking about having a conversation with the one who runs this whole universe. He's saying, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm right here. Talk to me. And listen, by the way, because that's part of prayer too. Pray without ceasing. Listen, if you don't pray, you're living by chance. A roll of the dice, the luck of the draw. And when we don't pray, you cannot experience your prayers being answered because you never prayed in the first place. But I don't think there's anything more amazing than seeing God answer your prayers. Seeing God answer. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock, the door will be open to you. How many can think of right now a prayer you said, however, and you know, whatever the answer was, you know that God answered. It's phenomenal. It reminds you of what he says, that I love you. It reminds you of what he says, I would die for you, and I did die for you. It reminds you of what he said, that I knitted you together in your mama's womb before you even literally were, before you lived out any of your days, I had them all planned for you. God's so personal, but if you don't pray, You miss out on so much, and God help you. Pray. So, church, let's ask. Let's get after it. Can we do that? I'm going to close right now, but let's. Can we get after it? Can we be the kind of people that pray? The kind of people that believe God? The kind of church that brings the needs of the people before the throne of God and knows what He said and knows what we heard in our spirit, no matter what things look like on the outside? Can we be that? You guys are not helping me. 
Can we be that? Yeah. All right, then I'm done. Almost. Not quite. That's what God wants. And everything God wants for you is in your best interest. Always, always, always. And, you know, today we're, we're going to receive communion or serve communion here in a few minutes. And we've honored some of our veterans um, today. We had the cadet corps here at first service. It was great. National anthem and flag ceremony and stuff. Um, serving is laying down your life for someone else's life. That's what it is. And it's, it's literally like whether it's a second or a minute, it's a piece of your existence at a cost, effort, whatever it is, time for somebody else. That's what our veterans have done. That's one of the reasons we're just so grateful for, for all of you. Because um, obviously most of us didn't serve our country in that way. But there's one who served everyone. There's one who literally laid his life down for all of us. And when God told Adam and Eve, don't touch that tree, you can have everything else. They had everything else. That one over there belongs to me. It's the knowledge of good and evil. Leave that one alone or, or else you'll die. He told them, don't do that. But you got all this and even the one thing, we couldn't leave it alone. We had to take what was God's. We had to go to that tree and do what God said not to do. He said, or you will surely die. Something had to die. Man had to die. Sin entered the world and things have changed ever since then. But it's why we need to remember that Jesus came as a man because God as a spirit lives forever. He can't die, but a man can die. And God came in the flesh as Jesus Christ to die, to make a payment for the sins that we've all committed. We can never ever do it on our own we don't have the stuff we don't have it we're we 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 need the tree we we're ne it's never good enough we're always we're not satisfied we have to go where he says not to go we trust ourselves more than we trust him somebody had to die jesus came said i love you this much stretched out his arms on the cross and died and it was an ugly brutal horrible death and even the Passion of the Christ movie, which everybody says is too gory and can't watch it. Look, that was like cotton candy compared to what Jesus went through. It's far worse than anything we can imagine. But we don't, he didn't do it so you'd feel guilty. He did it so you would know how much he loves you. And so as we take communion, we do an altar call first. It's a, just a chance to go, you know what? I'm going to live for you, Lord. Communion, when we say it's open, it means anyone can come if you're not from another church. But it's not open to everybody. It's open to people who believe. He said, do this in memory of me. So it means I know what he did. And that night, you know, when he was with the disciples and he broke the bread and he's like, I'm going to die for you. I'm going to spill my blood. And I want you to do this and, when, and do it often. Do it with everyday stuff like bread and wine. Do it in memory of me. So it's for believers. You're in the family of God. People say, oh, everybody's God's children. You're in the family of God when you believe. It's kind of an adoption thing, joint heirs of the throne. Anyway, the point is we, we take communion. The Bible says don't do it flippantly. Like don't do it reverent. Don't do it irreverently. Don't do it like pff, in, a, in a manner that's not good. So we like examine ourselves. We go, God, I'm a mess. I need to get like Elijah over there and like get down on the ground and just believe you and, and give you my petitions and ask for your help. And I need Jesus. Because without him, you're sunk. You're saved or you're sunk. It's the only way. We didn't say it. God said it. It's in the Bible. You got a problem, take it up with him. You want to try to shoot holes in it? Good luck. Aren't there a lot of ways to God? Many roads? No. One way, one truth, one life. Many roads to Jesus, but then it's a crossroads. No one comes to the Father but by him. So, let's pray for salvation in this place. Can we do that? If you're a Christian, be praying for someone who might not be saved. If you're not saved, you ask God to come into your heart right now. You'll never, you'll never be the same. He will lift guilt, shame, things you wish you'd never done or said. 
things that um, he'll give you purpose in the present. It's kind of a past, present, and future thing. He takes care of the past. No matter what you did, he says, come to me right now. I'm not going to bring that stuff up and shove that in your face, what you did. I'm not going to do that. I love you too much. Besides, I got work for you to do. I got an assignment for you. So you're going to have purpose in this life. You're going to have freedom from the past, and you're going to have an eternity that lasts forever that you can't even imagine where there's no shadow of turning. There's no darkness up there. There's so much light that there's not even a shadow, God says. And he's like, I love you. You're going to see life how it's supposed to be. So can we just pray together? Let's bow our heads. Father, we just pray for every believer in this place. Christians, be praying. Pray. Pray for those that are unsaved. And Lord, if there's someone in this tent that is one of those that we're all praying for right now, touch their heart, Lord. Give them the the sound of rain or say something in their spirit, Lord, that they know you're talking to them right now. Right now, God. Don't let one person, you said you didn't want one to perish, not even one, that if one little sheep wandered away, the shepherd was going after him, Lord. So that one sheep, or two, or five, or however many might be here, Lord, we pray right now, you just touch their heart. Let them know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're calling them into the kingdom. We just thank you for eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Now, if you need the communion elements, raise your hand. Little cup, little bread and wine. Everybody got them? If you don't have it, raise your hand. Okay, there's one over here. Thank you, Sam. Um, I'll make this quick. We've already talked about it. But uh, can I get one, Sam Rod? Please. Um, So there's the bread and the wine, the body and the blood. It's freedom. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. And thank you for your service, young man, my son-in-law, Marine. He said, do this in memory of me. He didn't say make a statue. He said, build it into your life. This right here, this broken body, broken for you, is how your broken body gets put back together and made whole. This bread right here, crushed, broken, think about that, is how your broken body gets put back together. There is healing in this bread. Go ahead and eat. In that same night, in that same manner, with that same group of people who are just like us, he took the cup. He gave it to all of them and said, this cup right here, this is my blood. And a lot of them didn't understand, but he's like, you'll get the revelation. This is my blood. I'm going to pour it out for you. I love you so much. I'm going to pour it out for you. And this blood right here is a new deal. He said it's a cup of a new covenant. You're not under the law anymore. You're not going to be put to death for, for getting something wrong. I'm going to pour it all over you. And there's healing in this blood. There's miracles in this blood. There's forgiveness in this blood. This blood right here is how much I love you. Go ahead and drink. Father, we just thank you for all the things we don't deserve. All your mercy, your grace, your power. You're such a good God. Too good to not believe. So we thank you. And we thank you for the family of God who ministers to one another bears one another burdens prays for one another we just thank you we just praise you love you it's in your son's name we pray amen and amen